Welcome to the recorded version of the Grantmakers in Aging web seminar, The Transformational Power of the Arts in Healthy Aging. Featuring Ann Basting, Professor of Theater at the Peck School of the Arts, David Leventhal, Program Manager for Dance for PD at the Mark Morris Dance Group, and John Feather, CEO of Grantmakers in Aging, from July 22, 2013. This event was made possible by a partnership between Grantmakers in Aging, the John A. Hartford Foundation, Grantmakers in Health, Grantmakers in the Arts, and the National Center for Creative Aging. Technical and production support is provided by the American Society on Aging. Thanks, Steve, and thank you all for uh, tuning in today. We want to welcome you to this conversation with GIA, uh, which is part of our continuing series of monthly webinars on critical topics of interest to funders in aging. Today's session, as Steve told you, is the transformational power of the arts in healthy aging. I'm delighted that so many of you have joined us today. Before we begin, I want to thank those whose support is making today's webinar available to funders. The John A. Hartford Foundation of New York provides continuing support for the series. And today, our co-sponsors are Grantmakers in the Arts, Grantmakers in Health, and the National Center for Creative Aging. We also want to thank the expert team at the American Society on Aging for providing technical and production support for the series. What is un the unique power of the arts to foster growth and expression at times of physical and emotional challenges? This question is being asked by researchers, philanthropists, and aging services providers across the globe. Drawing on their extensive experience as artists and teachers, our t speakers today will share their perspectives on ways that the arts, theater and dance in particular, foster community, create a sense of purpose, and nurture skills of expression and communication in older adults. We will also focus on recommendations for a sustainable replication of best practices in both law, large and small communities across the country before opening up to your questions. We are pleased to have two of our nation's best experts to help guide us through this discussion. Ann Basing is Professor of Theater at the Peck School of the Arts and Director of the Center on Age and Community, both at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. She is both a longtime creative artist as well as a scholar on the impact of the arts on healthcare. David Leventhal is a founding teacher and program manager for uh, Dance for PD, a collaborative program of the Mark Morris Dance Group and the Brooklyn Parkinson's Group. As a dancer, he performed with the Mark Morris Dance Group from 1997 to 2011, receiving the 2010 New York Dance and Performance Award for his performing career with Mark Morris. Welcome to you both. And Thank let's you. start with you uh, with, the, with the next slide. What are some of the trends that you are seeing at the national level linking aging, health, and the arts? Well, the, the biggest trend is growth. <laughs> I think um, I've really had the privilege of witnessing for uh, 15, 20 years now a shift where we were definitely on the fringe and now um, as an example on this slide I included the, the workshop, the day-long workshop that was hosted uh, convened by the National Academy of Sciences in September as a coalition uh, between the National Institute on Aging uh, uh, National, uh, National Endowment for the Arts and um, National Institute of, Alternative, of Complementary and Alternative Medicines and the Office of Behavioral and Social Science Research. It's astonishing that they really are recognizing this and, and it's now part of the mainstream effort to have gone from fringe to mainstream and, and then also to feel a popular hunger um, from families who are um, recognized, and older adults themselves, but old families for sure, who are recognizing this as being a strength um, and trying to get, get to the point where we can get these things, these programs dispersed widely. Uh, it's an exciting time, not just in the United States, but also across the world. Um, I know David was just over in, in Europe and uh, traveling and, and seeing that as well. I had a chance to go over a couple of years ago. It's just, it's a very exciting time of growth. 
as we go to the next slide, as you say, things are growing. Uh, tell us a little bit more about what you're seeing as a national trend. What I'm seeing is, is an attempt to try to bring programs that are out there uh, into conversation with each other. Um, the, the, we're a little bit behind in the research. Um, the, the, the white paper that came out of that session um, that was convened by the National Academy of Sciences really called for us to catch up on research. Um, I think that there's some challenges in that, which we'll talk about in a little bit, but I think the, the biggest need out there right now is for programs to talk to each other, learn from each other in order to proliferate. Um, you know, in my, in my uh, understanding, best is a four-letter word. Um, I, it's really much more towards sharing research basis that you want to build your program on, very specifically what your goals are, um, and then really we're all nationally at a, at a place of promising programs. Uh, we don't have enough research wrapped around this stuff. We're looking for even the, the mechanisms at the root of these programs, how they're working, what they work on specifically. Um, that, that white paper uh, that's available, um, I think the, the link will probably be available for everybody to get to that, um, but you can also just Google uh, arts and aging building the science and um, it'll come up and it's a nice long PDF document. Um, telling us that that's exactly what we need to do. We need to better understand the mechanisms, better understand how we can describe what's happening specifically in these programs, um, bring people together in order to, to cross, um, do work across the different disciplines. Uh, we don't need to just pull out one element anymore. Uh, we can find common denominators in the visual arts, the literature, the music, the dance and the movement, the more I think cross-discipline they are, the, the richer the experience for the older adults going through them. Um, the National Center for Creative Aging, which you see on this slide, um, has just recently launched their, um, their directory of creative aging programs in, in uh, the United States. And you'll see that there are a lot of them. Um, they're in various shapes of being research and evidence-based. Um, but the, the National Center is doing a great job of bringing people together to learn about these programs um, and to talk to each other in order to grow them. As we go to the next slide, you talked a little bit about research already, but what are the challenges in demonstrating the impact of these programs? Um, really, what I, what I see, and I did a commissioned paper for that in a, the National Academy of Sciences um, workshop day, um, uh, the expectations on arts programs and, and evaluating and researching the benefit of the arts and aging, and particularly my, my paper was on looking at um, comparing pharmaceutical interventions with non-pharma interventions, behavioral interventions, with arts-based uh, interventions. And the, the expectation is really on that old-fashioned gold standard, which is the double-blind randomized control trial, um, and that the impact should be on care costs. Um, or some sort of demonstration of cure um, when realistically <laughs> the strengths of arts-based approaches are really, um, in my experience, we're going to see the most impact on um, the social environment, on building relationships within the care systems. Um, the, the arts programs themselves are very flexible and individually tailored which makes it very difficult to do what they're calling for, a deep description of how uh, these programs work, because part of the benefit is that they're individually tailored. You, you can design them around an individual person. Um, and it makes it also very difficult to do um, blind uh, testing uh, and research, uh, that, that kind of a research model. Um, it's, it gets very expensive. Um, so most of the arts-based funding is still stuck in very small sample sizes, uh, which is also a critique from the, from the research sector. Um, finding the funding to, to, to do this work is also tricky. There's, there's a lot of hope um, in, in moving forward with the research designs around um, arts interventions, and I think that comes from finding the core, the common elements among a lot of different arts approaches so that you could evaluate 
um, different kinds of programs that are out there all in one large study so that you can get the sample size much larger. And then I think also encouraging flexibility of research design so that you're looking at much more mixed methods, not just quantitative, but one that is really looking at that environmental impact. Um, how are you able to enhance relationships with this? Uh, how are you able to improve quality of life? Um, there are no uh, pharmaceutical interventions that really sh that stop dementia or Alzheimer's. There, there, that shouldn't be an expectation of arts programming either. Um, it's really much more preventative, um, easing pain, uh, enhancing relationship and quality of life. Well, as we go on the next slide, there are also difficulties, I'm sure, in, in our challenges in building programs. What are some of those challenges? Well, and in this slide I pulled from David and I had a, have had a lot of fun conversations um, in the past year as well, and this is uh, one that I um, pulled out from his observation, which is that really, and you can see from the proliferation of programs from the National Center for Creative Aging, that the programs are now leading the research. There are really good, solid programs out there that have been doing this work for a decade now, and um, the the population is here. The older adults and the growth in that, that demographic curve that we've heard about for so many, since they were born, <laughs> from the baby boomers, we've been knowing that they're coming and they're here and the programs are here, but the research is behind. Um, and so it takes a leap of faith um, and it takes extra networking among those programs to figure out how to best evaluate what they're doing and to really move forward um, while that the research is catching up to where they are. Well, as we go to the next slide, one of the programs that, that you've been very deeply involved in from the beginning is uh, Time Slips, which is an innovative program that, uh, to use the words that, that you use, uh, replaces the pressure to remember with the freedom to imagine. Could you tell us about that program? It took me 15 years to get that simple line. Do you like that? <laughs> That's a good um, one. Yeah, it's, you know, it really grew out in 1996 of my dissertation research where I was studying senior theater groups across the country. And after writing a book about them, I had this realization that they were uh, this incredible transformation that could take place through theater by playing a new role uh, for older adults was mostly what I was observing and all of the positive benefits were for people who were largely healthy. And so I shifted my research toward people with dementia to see if playing a new role in some way could enhance their lives in the same way I saw it so dra dramatically. Sorry, I didn't actually mean that pun, but <laughs> with people um, who were healthy older adults. And practicing and practicing and practicing all kinds of different theater exercises that were mostly based in uh, reminiscence techniques. And then realizing that that was just not working with the population that was wrestling with really serious cognitive disabilities in a pretty toxic environmental setting. Um, and that once we shifted from that expectation of memory toward the, the freedom of just saying anything and, and working with imagination and symbolic expression through whether it was a gesture or a sound, uh, whatever it was going to be, we would accept it and weave it into a story. And it was just night and day. Suddenly, people with pretty serious dementia were able to participate, and it, and it really felt like um, this could change the way we see people with dementia, the way they see each other, um, and essentially we were creating a new role for them as a storyteller, which is a role that is valued and is, we're able to see it as valuable and relate to people with dementia when they play that role. I, I really, after doing a lot of research for so many years, think that the, the therapy, much of the therapy is needed for the people who surround the person with dementia um, in order to understand how to, to be friends with them and to, to help um, and to accompany them through the process of their, um, the experience of their symptoms. Well, as we go to the next one, uh, how does the program work? 
Well, you know, early on since um, we started the first testing of it in 1998, way, way, way back when, um, we were doing training in the method. It's really drawing people into um, a group or now you can also do it one-on-one, -on -one, sort of a super tiny group, um, where you use a prompt of some sort, an image. We're using questions and objects now and songs and all kinds of different prompts. Um, and then you ask open-ended questions, and you can see some of the samples of the open-ended questions um, on the slide. Uh, and then you're accepting everything, writing it down into a story. Um, and that's the job of the facilitator, um, to invite that expression from the person with memory loss or cognitive disabilities. Um, in 2011, after about a decade of doing in-person trainings and, and working, um, trying to get this out there as much as possible, we realized that the need was so much bigger than we could ever do in person that we really spent a good couple of years developing an online training. And then also what you see in front of you is right on our website, it's free interactive storytelling software so that families wherever they are, um, whether they're living at home, whether they have a loved one living in a care facility, um, that they can, they can learn this method and they can participate in it as well. Um, and you see the story page here. On the website, you just click on an image and you can, if you want to have the questions, you can click for questions, you can write your own story, you can publish it if you want to. The, one of the added bonuses is up on the upper right corner, the collaborate button, where you can, if you're living far away from a loved one you can, or a friend, you can click, I want to collaborate, and you can email, invite someone to do this with you wherever they are. Um, because too often families are simply communicating at this point about crisis management and not doing anything positive or fun together, and, and this breathes a little bit of hope and joy into that situation. Before we move on to the next slide, I do want to remind our audience that we will have time for questions uh, at the end of our presentation. And uh, you see in the box that's on your screen, there is a question box. Uh, please go ahead and type your questions in, and I will be uh, asking them of our panelists uh, as we come towards the end of the hour. So as we move to the next slide now, uh, improvisation is an important aspect of the theater. Uh, how is that concept used here? Well, basically, I think the improvisation um, marks a shift. And improvisation is, is in music, it's in dance, it's in visual arts, it's, it's at the core of all different arts disciplines. In theater, um, we've, you know, improvisation, comedy improv, we associate it with things like that. When, when we're using it in storytelling, we're basically saying um, we aren't looking at the losses in in healthcare settings, we're so primed to identify deficits and losses as quickly as possible. So like with uh, Alzheimer's and dementia, we have the mini mental status exam, which has been honed down to just, you know, as brief as possible to identify certain cognitive losses and does nothing to identify any strengths whatsoever. And so you come out of there saying, oh, I know what I can't do, but I don't know what I still can do. This kind of approach is shifting because the core of improv is to say yes and. And what that does is identify and accept where you are and the strengths that are there and you build on those strengths in order to build relationship. Um, it's a really beautiful thing when you see it um, happening in the moment. I tell you, healthcare settings are not meant to improvise. They're meant to reduce risk and to have repeatable outcomes as often as possible. So infusing improvisation into healthcare settings um, is a is a is a art in and of itself. <laughs> Indeed. As we keep moving on, uh, it, we, you're talking about the healthcare arena. We hear a lot about person-centered care, although honestly we don't see as much as we hear about it. Uh, how does Time Slips model fit uh, into that idea? Well, essentially with improvisation and recognizing the strengths that a person has, 
you're engaging into relationship with that person. And that's, this is a little bit about what I was talking about where arts programs that um, are, are, in my mind, really effective are the ones that are flexible to the individual. It involves listening intently. The time slips facilitators listen intently to what the person is responding to in the open-ended questions. And then they're echoing those responses to make sure they're getting it right. In essence, that facilitator is learning a new language that's being taught by the person with memory loss to them. Um, you're inviting and supporting individual voices. Um, you are creating a sense of belonging and community among the group storytelling setter, uh, sessions. Um, you're really creating a lab space for people to experiment with the communication that they have left. And you're not just accepting it, you're then when we turn toward the public education and the celebration component of time slips, which is once you get the stories, then the idea is that you share them in a very rigorous uh, way that reflects the quality that you believe um, is at the root of these stories. Um, that you're also then teaching other people how to be in relationship with people with memory loss and dementia. Um, in, uh, on the right side here, I just put sort of the shortened version of this, which is you're doing it with people, not for people. Um, you're not entertaining, but you're, you're engaging in an act of co-creation and that the goal is to have a shared experience in the present moment, um, not just parking someone with a, a connect the dots or, or a kind of a reflex, reflex oriented um, arts activity or activity, but you're actually in the moment with that person. And it's a very inspiring process. You have uh, videos and other things on your website that uh, we hope people will turn to. Uh, let's go to the next slide and, and ask you, could you talk about the impact this program has had? We've been really lucky because we've been around quite a while, um, as I said, and there's been several studies. I just put captured a little screen capture of this one study that's kind of the largest one um, that Tom Fritch and I, I'm included on the end there because they were nice enough to kind of send me a draft of it. <laughs> but um, they did a 20 nursing home study uh, and did it through observation and survey and um, they really found that what was happening on the 10 nursing home units where time slips was embedded uh, through observation of the whole unit, not just the people who are participating, that the places where time slips was embedded enabled people to kind of model a different kind of engagement. And the quantity and the quality of engagement on those units was higher than in the control, which was just activities as normal. Um, other studies have found uh, improvements in uh, mood and affect. Um, other studies, and, and also this study, showed that staff attitudes toward people with dementia improve. Um, and then in a study done by um, Daniel George, which just recently came out, um, medical doctors in training who use this as service learning um, started to see behavior as communication, and I just love that. <laughs> That's what we need our doctors to see. Rather than turning away from the person with dementia in the doctor's office toward the caregiver, to realize that all expression that's coming out of the person is communication. And also in long-term care facilities, that if someone is having what people call challenging behavior, that those behaviors are actually communication. They're telling you something that may be about pain or the toxicity of their environment. Um, and that's gonna be how we shift the way people with dementia are treated. A very inspiring message, certainly. And uh, we, we thank you for it. Um, we wanna to turn to uh, another, uh, what is often thought of as a, a challenging environment, uh, which is uh, uh, people with Parkinson's disease. And David, we wanna bring you in at this point. Uh, to talk about uh, the program that you've been involved in from the beginning. Uh, so if we move to the next slide, we see that uh, Parkinson's is often thought of as a very, very difficult and uh, debilitating and uh, obviously final fatal uh, disease. What do you see when you uh, talk to the folks that you work with about uh, Parkinson's and the way that you're approaching it differently? Well, first of all, hi, John, hi, and all the listeners. It's really great to be um, on this webinar, and I'm, I'm honored to present a little bit of what we do. Um, 
one of the things that we see with Parkinson's and other chronic diseases is that people run the risk of entering a state of permanent medicalization. So all aspects of their life sort of take on um, concern with thoughts about, anxiety about um, the condition they're living with, and it, it ends up taking over um, a large part of their, of their lives. Uh, even though with Parkinson's, there's a uh, you know, relatively low hospitalization rate at the beginning. And people live with Parkinson's, as you know, John, for, you know, 10, 20, 30 years. It's a long, long-term uh, condition that people have to deal with. So we see the, the threat in terms of um, sort of the way the medical system uh, treats people and ends up reconfiguring their identities um, as, as long-term sort of full-time patients. Um, and, and this slide really represents sort of a swirl of, of thought that people have to go through every day in dealing with the condition. Um, one of the other things with Parkinson's that we see is that there's a very definitive line in the ground where uh, medical and surgical interventions really don't make a difference, right? So there's, there's a certain, uh, there's a certain uh, amount of... Um, efficacy that, that certainly pharmaceutical and surgical interventions can produce, but they don't approach or address issues of quality of life, and a lot of things that Anne was talking about. They don't address relationships. They don't address sort of the daily existence. What, what do I do today to sustain or promote well-being? Um, and, and a pill or an implant is not the answer to that. Um, so simultaneously, while suggesting a, a potential danger of, of dealing with chronic disease only on the medical platform and reconfiguring people's identities as patients, we also see suggested in Parkinson's management a very different model, a model that integrates um, other forms of therapy, participation, and in, in my case, the arts, um, as something that, that really focuses on those other elements like quality of life, like relationships, uh, sense of self, sense of confidence. And what we end up seeing is that a lot of those elements actually translate back into, um, into motor skills. So it's, it's a very interesting place to be. Once we move to the next slide then, uh, you've already talked a little bit about the program and so forth. How does, it, how does it actually work and what does it tell us about the importance of the arts and healthy aging? Well, I think one of the, the interesting things about Parkinson's is it really actually provides a window into the aging process in general. For those of you on the call who uh, are not working with people with Parkinson's or, or don't see that as part of your, your world, I would invite you to at least look at Parkinson's as, as a, a kind of a cross-section of, of different conditions that, that happen naturally in the aging process um, in terms of balance issues, uh, cognitive issues, uh, issues with, with motor function, um, uh, and, and all of those, the aspects, I'm not going to go very far into the symptoms, they're, they're uh, fairly easily researched. But um, so I, I sort of see Parkinson's not only on its own, but as a window into, into aging in, in, in general. And that way we can really use it as a model for how we address those things. In the same way, um, you know, dance has a very special position because um, in terms of society, a lot of people think of dance as just another form of exercise. Um, and when we started our program, in fact, a lot of people said, oh, it's so good that you're providing dance exercise for Parkinson's. <laughs> um, well, having been a professional dancer for many years and, and you know, sort of viewing seeing ourselves more as, as artists than as athletes, although certainly there are many athletic qualities to dancing, um, it, it put us in an interesting position because a lot of the research in Parkinson's has in fact been done on exercise, um, fitness and, and cycling and uh, weightlifting, that sort of thing. Um, and what we see in traditional exercise interventions um, is that we're, the focus is, is primarily on things like strength and endurance uh, flexibility and balance, and that's that's classically what we uh, what we look at in in physical fitness programs. The thing is that those those elements are extremely important for people with Parkinson's, um, and so traditionally exercise interventions have worked quite well. The problem is that going back to the previous the previous slide and what I just said is that there are so many other aspects of of Parkinson's that are in some ways of more import 
to the, the people themselves than than a tremor or than um, dealing with with flexibility. So, um, and that's really where the dance and other arts come in to to pick up uh, pick up where exercise leaves off. Um, we see in a, in a dance class, just as Anne was talking about, that the class itself is not focused on a problem. It's not focused on uh, a difficulty. It's focused on really allowing people to see the possibilities that are still open to them and the, um, the, the, the abilities of what they still have, what they can still do, rather than focusing on what their limits are. Um, we focus on creativity. We focus on giving people an opportunity to use different cues, different ideas, and this, different goals, right? So our goals are aesthetic rather than mechanical. Uh, we use, we integrate the imagination in a way that people are thinking of movement differently than they might in a physical therapy session or an exercise sh session. Um, we use storytelling, just as Anne does, though we, we do it through gesture, um, to give people a sense of confidence and a sense of linear action through what they're doing, which is important not, not simply in artistic training, but has a very strong resonance for people with Parkinson's who may start to lose the roadmap of getting from point A to point B. Um, and, and finally, you know, a dance class is a social environment. You, you can't be in there and not interact with other people. Um, and so one of the things that happens through any kind of shared artistic practice uh, or training is that you're building connections with the teachers and with the other participants, as well as with the people who come with you, spouses, partners, uh, care partners who are welcomed into the class, just as, as Anne was talking about. So these are, these are elements that, that happen in a dance class that probably don't happen um, in traditional exercise interventions. And I think, you know, the, the emphasis on seeing our participants as artists and as learners is a huge step forward toward giving them, uh, allowing them to return to a sense of uh, their whole selves. That's great. Uh, as we move to the next slide, you've talked a little bit about the philosophy uh, behind Dance for PD. Is this a patient-oriented program? Well, um, that's, a, that's a complicated question because we actually don't really refer to uh, people in our class as patients. We don't see those patients. All of the classes take place in, uh, in art settings, dance studios, community centers, um, um, you know, college dance facilities. So um, once people step into that facility, uh, into that studio, into that art space, they really shed their sense of themselves as patients and come into a different kind of community. Um, what you see on, on this slide is, is rather centered on our activities here in Brooklyn, but we welcome participants into the artistic life of a professional dance company. Um, so in the, in the upper left slide, we actually did a performance um, in November, which had 17 members of our Dance for Parkinson's class performing five pieces. Three, uh, two of those pieces were excerpts from Mark Morris' repertory. So this is a program where we're not, we're not dumbing down the material. We're, we're really finding ways to adapt it so that people with Parkinson's have access to high-quality uh, choreography. And, and in some ways, I would tie this very much to Anne's program um, and very much to other arts organizations that have opened their doors and provided the same kind of high-quality access that uh, they might give to, um, to you know, the average visitor. I'm, I'm speaking specifically of, of not just Anne's program, but something like Meet Me at MoMA, where, um, for those of you who don't know, a, a program uh, designed for people with dementia, but really using the resources and riches of, of the Museum of Modern Art to provide a first-rate artistic experience. And that's what we're, we're really trying to do as well. So that's the performance on the left. We also invite people in the class to come see performances of the Mark Morris Dance Group. This is a photograph on the right, upper right of um, the intermission at the Brooklyn Academy of Music, where they saw the group perform. Lower left is Mark Morris actually giving a, um, a lecture demonstration to members of our group. So they're, they're actually meeting um, the, the lead artist here himself and rehearsal on the lower right there. So this is a class that focuses on all aspects of dancing, right? So we're really thinking of these participants as, um, as, as artists in their own right and try to give them as many resources as we can um, to stimulate, to engage them. 
as possible. And if I'm not mistaken, the uh, young man in the green shirt at the rehearsal is you, right? Uh, that looks familiarly like me, yes. <laughs> exactly. Uh, if we go on to the next one, uh, next slide then. Uh, what is the impact of this program been? Well, uh, you know, we, we're in this same position as Anne in terms of we haven't been around quite as long. We, this is our 13th year, but um, we have, there have been some preliminary research studies that uh, have been uh, shown, shown some significant um, improvements both in motor skills and quality of life. The, the challenge, of course, is that those studies have been very small cohorts, 10 people, 15 people, maybe 20 at most. So. Um, we sort of rely, have come to rely on a number of other, other things, other tools to help measure the impact. Um, so we have worked with a researcher at the University of Denver to develop a quality of life survey because the traditional quality of life measure for Parkinson's, which is called PDQ39, um, when done in tandem with an open-ended survey, yielded very uh, neutral results. Well, we knew anecdotally that people in this class really thought of the class as a, what I could call a quality of life lifeline, you know, that for them it was a vital part of their week and it really allowed them a sense of self um, and a sense of um, engagement that they didn't get otherwise. So we sort of redesigned the tool to capture uh, what was happening. Certainly motor skills are a big part. I mean, dance, uh, every aspect of dance training from balance training, coordination, musicality, um, flexibility, uh, imagination, using the image in the service uh, of, of movement, all these things that dancers have done for many, many centuries, if not millennia, um, are particularly valuable for people with Parkinson's um, and, and particularly valuable for motor skills. So that's something that we can measure, and we have measured in several, several um, research studies. Personal accounts, um, anecdotal accounts, not just from the people with Parkinson's themselves, but from partners and spouses, um, have been significant in helping us really determine what it is about this class that helps transform people's lives. Um, there are other ways, you know, uh, media reports, uh, we have, we have an at-home DVD that we, um, we have available for people who want to practice at home. It's really designed for people who are part of a regular group, group class, um, who can, uh, practice at home and then come to the class, or for people who are, live in more isolated areas and really don't have access to this kind of class yet, although we hope they will. Um, so seeing where those DVDs are sent, where, where is the interest and what is the rationale um, behind people ordering that? What, what do they want out of it? Um, one of the things that's often forgotten about in terms of looking at impact is attendance. And here we're really looking predominantly not at huge numbers because we're, you know, we're, uh, Again, we're, we're in a situation where we're dealing with a condition that um, whose, one of whose main attributes is, is uh, apathy, really having you know, the difficulty of getting out and doing things. So we, we know we have a certain amount of resistance just getting people to any kind of activity, no matter how fun it is. Um, but looking at attendance and really figuring out, you know, do people come back? How often do they come back? What kind of percentages are we looking at? Um, one of the things we included recently in terms of uh, a study was looking at how the class impacts activities of daily living. And again, at the beginning, we weren't interested in that. We were really looking at, you know, how well are we able to, um, to share information about this art form with this population. But it's, you know, it's, it's interesting also to see how the class reverberates into people's lives. How do they use some of the information um, to help them move around or help them think about movement in a different way? One other thing that I want to mention before, before moving on is this idea of uh, the organizational effect. I think wherever this class has, has sprouted, and it's, it's uh, in about 100 communities right now, um, it has changed the organization, the dance organization, in which it takes place. So I think it's changed the way that dance organizations see their role in working with uh, an aging population, working with a special population, whether it's Parkinson's or something else, and really redefining um, the role of the company in the community. And that's been extremely exciting to see. Um, I think going back to the original conversation that, that started today, you know, we've seen, uh, we saw in that chart a great increase in, in the number of people over 65. But I think one of the things that's interesting is the, if we, if we kind of tie that to the, the baby boomer uh, generation, we also can see a parallel to the great rise in what I'd call 
you know, the expansion of the American arts enterprise. I mean, the the post-war um, sort of heyday for post-war, Ameri- post-war American arts was really, you know, the same generation that this group of baby boomers grew up in. So as they age, there's a very strong interest in continuing to be to participate and engage in the arts. Um, it's not an accident, I think, that we're seeing such a strong development of these programs as baby boomers come through. It's not just that they're getting older. It's that they um, had really grown up in, in 50s, 60s, 70s, a time when the, the arts, uh, arts engagement and involvement in this country, and arts funding, by the way, skyrocketed. So um, it's interesting to see that come, come full circle and start to impact the arts organizations themselves in a different way. Are you also starting to see uh, interest in this approach around the world as we go to the next slide? We are. This was something that we weren't sure about when we started. Um, we really designed the program to be done here in Brooklyn. Um, and then because the Mark Morris Dance Group is a touring company, we started to take the program out on the road and introduce it to other communities, which then led to training teachers in other communities. Um, but what we found is because dance is really a universal language and uh, Parkinson's is seen all over the world, but there's been a very strong interest um, in, in the model that we started here in Brooklyn and in, in other places. Um, this has certainly meant some challenges for us. I mean, we're, we're still relatively um, small staff, very small staff, and, and really, you know, focused, focused on our activities here in Brooklyn. But as much as we can, we provide resources and training to people from all over the world. One thing that's been interesting is that, um, you know, the class is adapted uh, in various ways to be culturally specific. So we don't have, you know, a set curriculum that everybody around the world has to do um, a scene from a Broadway show at the end of class. So in, in, in Pune, India, for example, uh, their class is based not on the ballet and modern technique that we use, but on, uh, on Katak, which is a traditional Indian form. And then they, they work on, uh, instead of doing more sort of Broadway show or musical theater, uh, dancing at the end, they'll they'll work on on Bollywood numbers. So I think it, it's adapted um, very well to to other communities, and we try to create a network that allows people to exchange ideas um, and to connect both on the teaching level, but also on the participant level. Well, it, it's a very inspiring model uh, that many people are now coming to know and and be interested in. Uh, as we go to the next slide, and uh, let's bring you back in. Uh, one of the traditional criticisms of arts programs in healthcare is that they are nice uh, rather than necessary. How are you bringing uh, research into the picture to show the impact of these programs? Um, I, I addressed that a little bit in the beginning, um, and I, I, I want to go back to saying that we very much have to be um, flexible in the way that we um, design these. I think the, the best possible way to design evaluation and research around, um, you know, a, a program, I don't want to say intervention because it's, it, it tends to be more in the medical model. Um, and David's done such a good job of shifting us out of that. <laughs> um, I think the best thing to do is to um, sit down with a research team and the team of artists that are working on a program and uh, and observe what's happening. Um, as, as David said, the, 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 um, the research tools that are out there aren't picking up the benefit here um, oftentimes because they're not, they're not developed for the specific interventions or programs that are, that are out there. So they're, they're still picking up um, uh, losses. They're still picking up uh, sensitive things like that, but they're not necessarily capturing the specific strengths that we're seeing demonstrated in these kind of arts programs. Um, I see in, in time slips in moving forward in research, and, and this is also, I think, um, apply, applicable to several other different kinds of arts programs out there, is particularly with people with dementia and memory loss who are in care facilities, one of the biggest things you, you hear about is challenging behaviors. And this has become uh, an excuse for um, prescribing psychotropic drugs that really kind of deaden people's behaviors so that they become compliant and easier to care for. Um, it's a real, that, that creates part of the toxic environment. And um, I, there's a real national initiative now of trying to reduce these psychotropics, understand challenging behaviors in a different way, 
And I think these arts programs can have a real impact there um, in particular. Uh, you see definite changes in attitudes toward, uh, toward dementia and toward people with dementia um, among uh, not just the staff, but also family and students as well. There's been, we've had several time slips because the training is online now, we have a lot of different um, high school and college uh, classrooms that include this as a, like a course book and then it's part of their service learning for the semester in classes like psychology or all the way to nursing and social work to religion and theater and English. It's pretty incredible the, the breadth of classrooms that are taking this on. And of course, people have begin with real hesitancy and fear of working with people with dementia and the process that um, through which going through and, and playing with people and encouraging play and improvisation with people with memory loss just dramatically changes people's attitudes about what that means to live with those symptoms. I think also that, you know, we're going to need all hands on deck. We're going to need a massive volunteer network to care for people with memory loss and to work with people with memory loss and that um, these kinds of positive based programs can really help people increase volunteerism. And again, as David talked so beautifully about the, the quality of life, not just for the person with memory loss, but also for the family um, as a whole and for staff um, is, a, is a big way to do it. And, and I also think that David makes, makes a great point about arts organizations changing, that um, we, we found through an expansion of, of a time slipped improvisational method where we did a project called the Penelope Project with um, Sojourn Theater. We infused improvisation all across the care community from independent living to assisted living to the nursing home and the adult day program and invited the families in, invited the staff to collaborate on a multi-year project where we started with Homer's Odyssey um, and really what would happen to the facility? Could we infuse collaboration and improvisation in the facility through that process? It was just an amazing experience. And now a new project that we're doing and wrapping similar research around is basically that model, but in uh, community-based care programs, reaching older adults who are living alone at home um, and trying to bring creative engagement to them. Um, and wrapping evaluation and research around it to see what the impact is on quality of life and connectivity and social isolation. Well, David, as we go to the next slide, uh, we're obviously talking to an audience of funders here and many work at the local level. I mean, sometimes it's difficult, I think, for people to, to hear about national and international programs and know how to help specifically. What are some of the ideas that have worked in other communities? It's a great question, John. I think a lot of times funders don't know where to access a program or, or how, you know, how a certain amount uh, of money can help make an impact, and that's what we all want to do. So um, what we've seen in our program, at least, is that, that some uh, rather modest investments over, over the course of uh, the last 10 years have made a huge impact on, on our ability to share what we do with as many people as possible. Um, I know Ann and I have sort of put together some of those ideas, but uh, one of the things that was incredibly helpful to us was a uh, grant from the National Parkinson Foundation um, in 2008, which allowed us to create a short informational video. Um, I can't, I can't emphasize enough the amount of leverage that we've gotten out of that video in terms of introducing the whole idea of what we do to um, to, to new populations, to people with Parkinson's, to other potential funders, to you know, because a lot of what we do is, is um, building collaborations in other communities to support this kind of program. Um, often we're working communities where there isn't really what I would call a dance infrastructure. People don't understand what we're doing. Um, and so we needed a very strong visual story to, to tell um, so that people really understood what was behind the program. And, and that was, um, that was a, a a really an incredible investment, I think, by the, by the foundation that really allowed us to share this with others. Um, obviously, the ongoing costs of, of uh, class funding are, are rather significant for us um, because we have 
you know, a pool of teaching artists um, and musicians who work here. Um, but there are other other access points. You know, a, a website, for example, or or building out part of a website um, can be can be done for a rather modest amount of money. But the impact, the way that that um, that initiative can can influence the scope of the program can be huge. Um, Likewise, we actually have some funders who are interested in touring in, in our touring master class series who want to support the, the sort of um, the spread of the program to communities that might not otherwise be able to afford bringing um, teachers from our program to offer a demonstration class. And we do a lot of that around around the country and then some some globally as well, uh, because you know again I think with with dance and theater particularly, uh, seeing is believing. It often is very hard to describe virtually what's going on, but, but actually having a class where you're inviting all of the potential stakeholders in the community to see what's going on can make a, an enormous impact. And that, that's made possible through the generosity of funders who, again, we're not, we're not talking about six figures here. We're talking about relatively modest uh, contributions that really, really help move, move things forward for us. Well, I want to make sure that we have a little bit of time for questions, so I'm going to ask us to, to move to the, the last slide. Both of you have already talked about this, so I'm, I'm actually going to uh, use a, a quote that uh, David used uh, sometime in the past, uh, that we sometimes slow it down, but we never dumb it down. So that, that importance of excellence uh, and inclusivity and making sure everyone's included, I think, comes through very powerfully in your uh, presentations. I do want to ask you then a couple questions, uh, and then we'll, uh, we'll wrap it up with you both. Uh, the, the first question is about, it, both of you are creative artists uh, yourself, have worked professionally in the, the arts uh, environment for a long time. How, how do you see your own personal uh, life as an artist and as a person uh, changed by these programs? Anne? Wow. Um, <laughs> I think I have become a consummate collaborator um, through this work. Um, and I think on this, this very slide is, is the reason for that, which the bottom line is that teacher and student applies to everyone. And when I first started doing time slips um, improvisational sessions, I came out of those sessions feeling like I had learned so much and that, that the limitations of my imagination for whatever linear chrono, you know, thought process I was going through was just opened it with every response was a surprise. Um, and it's really uh, impressed upon me uh, and, and driven me toward devised work, um, intensive collaboration work. Um, at, you know, the, the projects have gotten increasingly more complex with more partners and um, more, more creative process involved with them over longer periods of time. So. I really have the people with memory loss to thank for that, I think, um, as we move forward. And, and it also, I think part of the excellence and inclusivity is that we, we really are working with top tier, height of career artists here who we're infusing into that world of people who happen to be diagnosed with something. Um, and that those artists, you know, the slide on the bottom there left for me is, is an artist named Beth Phelan who was inspired by the time slip stories to create. This is from a maquette of an exhibit um, from story, uh, illustrating different stories. And I've, I think bringing those two worlds together has taught me that it's possible in sort of the Liz Lerman horizontal model. Um, and I've become a real firm believer in that as I've, as I've evolved as an artist myself. David? Well, I really, I really couldn't have said it better, and that was incredible. And, and a lot of the shared, uh, shared knowledge here, in terms of our experience, I have been incredibly fortunate and grateful um, to the, the people with Parkinson in our, in our class and the people I've taught all over the all over the place um, in being able to learn from them. I mean, the, the thought of um, being able to learn more about movement um, and about how to move and how to dance from folks with movement disorder is something that. I might have been surprised with before this program, but in being part of it, it really reminds me of the, you know, the interchangeability of the roles of teacher and student, and the the, the fact that we are perpetually learning all the time. Um, one of the things we've tried to do in this program is is 
really bring the highest quality uh, instruction, but but always remember that we're learning as much, if not more, as teachers the whole time as well, and really being open to listening um, to what participants are coming in with, to what they want to share, to what they want to do. We're teaching, yes, but more than anything else, facilitating their experience and learning from them about how we can um, best approach what they want to do. So I think that, that may be a bit different from how other people sort of go into um, a teaching career after a professional performing career where you think, well, I've, I've done this for a long time and I know a lot, I'm going to share it with people. And, and there's, there's an element of that, but much more than that, we've done this for a long time and now we're ready to learn a lot more about, um, about how people think about movement, about how people use their imaginations, about how people form social communities, and there's so much to learn. It's really a wonderful message. Uh, I think we're coming to the end of our time together, uh, and I wonder if I could ask uh, both of you to uh, to see if there's anything that you would like to leave our uh, audience with today, uh, either as as funders or as individuals or as caregivers or as human beings. Uh, Anne, I would say um, for um, the as echoing what David said. Um, a little bit of funding can go a long way toward bringing these um, really hopeful uh, opening experiences to people whose lives are being, that the whole field of, of the healthcare field is closing them down with their losses and their diagnoses. Um, and bringing these things in just infuses um, hope and growth and learning um, and a, a little bit goes a long way. And also to, to urge people to connect um, with these networking places like the Center for Creative Aging, which where a lot of the different kinds of approaches that David and I have been kind of alluding to um, are all, you can see them all in hot links to, to the different types of programs that are out there. David? Yes. So well said. And I think one of the things that we see, especially in, in Parkinson's and other other uh, medical conditions, that there's a lot of focus on, on scientific research and a lot of funding that goes towards scientific research, uh, approximately $300 million devoted to Parkinson's research alone, and that's on the, the smaller end of, of other things uh, that, that, um, that, are, that are being studied. Um, and it's important work. It's significant work. We need that research to happen. But for people with a chronic disease, there's a very strong focus on the what now. What do I do today? What can I do right now that's going to uh, help my quality of life? What can I do right now that's going to um, maintain, sustain, or improve my relationships with my partner, my spouse? Um, what are some activities that I can do now that can give me the power to manage my own experience? And I think that's really where the arts come in. And I think that's the message that, that I would love funders to, to hear, especially in Parkinson's world, because there's certainly money that is needed for research, and it's very expensive work. But for a fraction of that, um, there could be a huge, uh, huge impact made through arts programs and through other kinds of activities that would really address that question that, that people with Parkinson's and other chronic diseases really want answered, which is, what can I do myself right now that's going to make me feel better? And, and that's the arts play a huge part of that. On behalf of all of us at Grant Makers and Aging, I want to thank Ann Basing, the Professor of Theater and Director of the Center on Age and Community at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee, and David Leventhal, the Founding Teacher and Program Manager for Dance with PD, for your expertise and particularly for your passion in bringing the arts to older persons. We thank you for all that you do. We also want to thank the John A. Hartford Foundation, Grant Makers in the Arts, Grant Makers in Health, and the National Center for Creative Aging for their support of this program, as well as to the American Society on Aging for their technical expertise. And finally, I want to thank all of you for participating in today's webinar. Have a great day.